Hello, everyone. This is Anthony Locker with Tory Hills Capital, and welcome to the Better Life Pharma podcast for June 24th, 2021. I hope everyone is doing well in the circumstances, and I want to thank you for taking the time today uh, to join us. We are very excited uh, to bring you Better Life Pharma. Uh, the company has a pipeline of drug candidates that include three compelling and differentiated assets. Better Life's drug pipeline includes psychedelic drugs for the treatment of major depressive disorders and other neuro neuropsychiatric disorders as well. It also includes an antiviral drug to address early stage COVID infection with other applications as well. Better Life trades on the OTC market under the ticker BETRF and on the CSE exchange under the ticker symbol BETR. The company shares are currently trading with a market cap of only $20 million. Uh, we feel that there is plenty of upside as the company is positioned to take advantage of the growing market for no, uh, novel psychedelic and antiviral drugs, which we'll definitely touch base on uh, during the call. Uh, with us today to discuss Better Life Pharma and the company's strategy going forward is the company's CEO, Ahmad, Ahmad Darudian, and we also have Dr. Mark Swain, the editor of Biopub and Torrey Hills Capital's resident expert on all things biotech and pharma. Hello, gentlemen. Welcome today. Thanks, Anthony. Good morning. It's great to have you on. I want to welcome you to our virtual presentation, and thanks for taking the time to bring our viewers up to speed on Better Life Pharma. Before we get started, I just want to mention that if our viewers have any questions during the presentation, simply type your question into the Q&A box, and we'll make sure it gets answered. And um, with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Mark Swain for some opening comments, and then uh, Ahmad Darudian will take us through the investor presentation, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. So with that Thanks, said, the floor is yours. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. I, I I guess I'm sort of the warm up act. Dr. Drudy and his Led Zeppelin, but you'll like his performance <laughs> very well. Uh, I, I'm a shareholder in the company. Just for sake of full disclosure, I do some advising to Better Life, and uh, I uh, we covered it at my website, Biopub. I, I I'm very proud to be a shareholder. I think it's one of the most auspicious investments I have. I think that Dr. Drudy has poised the company to do what we call what's called a hat trick in hockey three three consecutive field goals because of two major programs the first in COVID-19 therapeutics need for which is going to be with us for a while uh, the inhaled interferon regimen using interferon alpha 2b uh, is I, I think it's going to be a winner I think it's going to knock it out of the park in terms of preventing the serious pulmonary complications of COVID and I say that from the position advantage of having used interferon for decades to treat hepatitis C prior to the advent of the oral agents. Uh, uh, it's very, very promising and exciting program. And kudos to the company for exhuming and reanimating that drug after it had been mothballed at the end of the kind of the, the treatment era for hep C. The second thing that's pretty promising, and I, again, I think two, you know, two home runs or two, two big hits, you know, looming here. The first is this non-hallucinogenic uh, uh, psychedelic drug, Tubrum of LSD. There are many reasons to think that's pretty auspicious for treating recalcitrant, you know, persistent depression. So much depression out there as it's now managed basically just turns into this problem of the walking wounded who really never get well on their SSRIs or their dual reuptake inhibitors, unfortunately. Time for something stronger and better and the second agent is the, the dihydrohinochiol taken from magnolia bark. Uh, very interesting agent in that it, it kind of acts like a benzodiazepine, but without the downsides of that. No habit formation, no tolerance withdrawal, those kinds of issues. And so could become really a very popular drug in clinic because of its ability to act as a chill pill, but without the downsides of the others that are on the market, which are so, so addictive. So, um, uh, Dr. Drudian, welcome and uh, regale us with uh, what's going on. It's a very auspicious time to, interesting time to be a shareholder at Better Life. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Thanks, uh, Anthony. Yeah, we're, we're excited. Uh, this, these are, you know, I, I come from uh, the pharma side of things. Uh, I've been in the business 30 years. I was trained as a scientist, uh, you know, a PhD from UBC here. Uh, but from my perspective on, a, on the business side of things and be, coming from pharma and, and uh, getting products to commercial and actual uh, pharmacoeconomics side that would make sense, 
you know, I think these are uh, these are great assets that we've got uh, in our in our pipeline, and the development of them. You know, as much as we can de-risk it and make it uh, make it work uh, with the most efficient use of capital is really what my job is to orchestrate this with the team. So I'll go through this, and I'm happy to answer questions, but I'm more of a narrative. I, I like to talk about uh, things rather than just read uh, read slides, but you know, I'll, I'll, I'll come up, I will, I will combine the two. So as Mark said, we have uh, three products on the development, two in the non-hallucinogenic psychedelic uh, area and one in the antiviral. The, this, the psychedelic side, uh, you know, the, the lead compound TD0148A, uh, it is. This is basically non-hallucinogenic LSD. It's a. It's an LSD molecule uh, brominated uh, that uh, you know we were we want to develop for depression. Uh, IND filing projected uh, uh, first quarter of next year, and we have a couple of patents on the manufacturing side that eliminates the controlled substance uh, use uh, uh, side of things, as well as we have filed. Uh, uh, patent pending right now methods of use uh, uh, for a variety of indications. The hydrohonochial TD010 uh, from Magnolia Bark. Uh, this one we're developing for benzodiazepine dependency. Same timeline uh, as, as uh, 0148A with the uh, method of use uh, patent pending that we have filed uh, for anxiety, uh, benzodiazepine di disorder and others. The antiviral, the interferon inhalation is actually our oldest project. Uh, and uh, especially on the interferon side, this goes back to where we were private. And we spent a couple of years, uh, if not more, to develop uh, our own uh, interferon alpha 2 b is a biologic that's tough to make. And Merck was exiting it because, uh, because its use for hepatitis has gone down. And uh, our, our uh, formulation is an inhaled interferon for early stage COVID-19. And I know I wanna, I'm happy to answer questions regarding vaccinations and the prevalence of this, but uh, we believe this is going to be uh, quite a bit of uh, excitement around and, and this and the use of uh, products for treatment like ours as a cocktail is going to be needed for years and probably decades to come. IND filing end of this year, and uh, we have a patent uh, pending composition and formulation, as well as treatment uh, for this. These are the, the timelines, and I, I'll draw your attention to uh, you know, current status. We're doing preclinical IND enabling studies. There are various stages uh, with 03, the interferon one, uh, IND enabling studies, as well as uh, we're doing an investigator run clinical study in Chile, in Chile, uh, uh, at the Catholic University in Santiago uh, to, to start uh, in short order. Um, and with, with, mo with all of them, you know, we want to start uh, with the two first two phase one study early next year, followed by phase two uh, later that year, uh, same with uh, with uh, uh, our uh, AP003. I'll just go through this whole uh, uh, thing on the, on the psychedelic side and why we believe non-hallucinogenic uh, psychedelics are, are the one way to go. Uh, this space is, you know, the mental health as a, as a, as a space is really opening up uh, as some of you may be aware. Uh, and really, when you look at, um, you know, people are coming out and it's not, it's not a shame to ask for help now if you're depressed or your anxiety, you have anxiety or PTSD or other disorders. And this has opened up. I mean, um, celebrities, politicians, Prince Harry, people are coming out saying, you know, we, mental health is important. We should address it. And that has opened up a huge uh, uh, you know, market, uh, potential market here with psychedelics as lead compounds, because we really haven't figured out the brain yet uh, in, in many ways. 
unlike other organs. And we psychedelics are known to work, uh, LSD, 1940s or 50s. But most of the work right now is being done in psychedelics is basically you will need, you will hallucinate. The side effects are hallucination and other things. But which means you have to be in a clinic, you have to be monitored. So uh, our approach is different. Uh, we think if you really, if you believe the numbers, uh, you want to treat 10 million, 20, 50, 100 million new people in this opening space here, uh, it's hard to do it in, uh, you know, how many clinics do you have to open up? Staff, monitor, this, that. So we believe the, the non-hallucinogenic approach to be a much better way to really, really open the floodgates. And we're not interested in opening any clinics. So our approach, non-hallucinogenic, and we think we have the absolute best compound. This is a non-hallucinogenic LSD. Uh, it's an analog of LSD. If you see on the right side of the screen, uh, this is basically LSD with a, with a you know, bromine attached to it. It was invented by Albert Hoffman at, uh, uh, in, 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 the, in the 40s, in the, the guy who synthesized LSD, the Swiss chemist. Uh, it's shown to be non-hallucinogenic in human trials. It's considered, with the hardcore psychedelic crowd, it's considered uninteresting. I was in a presentation with psychedelic investors uh, who are really, they've been doing this uh, they, they've been uh, interested in psychedelics for a long time. And some of the comments was, well, I, I like the hallucination part. I like the, I mean, it's great as, you know, if you're using it yourself, but as a treatment, it's somewhat, uh, you know, it, it, it is limiting. So uh, it's, it was shown uh, to be effective in cluster headache in a study in 2010 run by uh, researchers in Germany and Harvard University. And uh, what we have done, we acquired this asset uh, about seven months ago from a company called Transcend Biodynamics. It's, uh, it's an active ingredient. Uh, it, it's, it's an active ingredient is, is bromo LSD, uh, two bromo LSD. And there's a patent, couple of patents issued. And what we liked about it is that the patents basically uh, the process uh, uh, for manufacturing this does not use LSD. Right now, if you want to make two bromo LSD, you start with LSD. And that means lots of different permits, uh, uh, restrictions, uh, controlled substance acts, and so on. I'll show you in a, in a table in the next slide. So our patents basically bypass all of that. So we don't have to, uh, you know, we have the path of least resistance, if you will, in manufacturing this compound. And there is no residual LSD uh, in 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 the mix in the in the in the product, and the final product uses uh, you know totally free controlled substance. Uh, um, they are totally free of controlled substances. So uh, I want to draw your attention to uh, you know what is what is the biggest issue with psychedelics? You know they need as I mentioned to you in point in, you see in point one. It must be performed in special clinics with close monitoring by trained therapists, you know, and I've had a lot of education on this in the last seven months uh, talking to clinicians, experts, uh, people we have brought on, uh, on our team that, you know, it's a lot easier said than done. We're going to treat someone, even microdosing. That, uh, you know, couple of hours of from what we learned, last couple of hours of hallucination is not easy. And to bring a patient out, besides the fact that it's a completely different pharmacoeconomic model, if you have to get up, go to a clinic, uh, be, be monitored and so on, the cost of that versus what we are developing, which you can get uh, you know, from a, a dispensary, from a, from a, a pharmacy, uh, your friendly neighborhood Walmart or Walgreens, uh, and go home just like you do with antibiotics. We think that's a, that's a much better, uh, a more practical way if you want to treat the millions and millions of millions of people. So, in in addition to that, it's also 
when you use controlled substances, in my younger days, I used to supply uh, codeine and a narcotic uh, uh, to, to some of the biggest chains in Canada. I mean, handling controlled substances, manufacturing, distribution, and so on is, is expensive, it's regulated. You know, RCMP, FBI, all these uh, permits that you need to have, the monitoring, the, the, the accounting of it, as opposed to something that's not controlled is a completely different economic model. So if you see in the, in the, in the table, uh, we compare ourselves to psilocybin, LSD, MDMA, these are the three uh, leading compounds being, being worked on by other companies right now. Our uh, two bromo LSD uh, is, uh, you know, it's not scheduled uh, one drug, uh, it has human uh, studies. It's not hallucinogenic, unlike others. Doesn't use any list one precursor. It's not contravening any, you know, UN convention illicit drug. But what I like about it, again, I come from the pharma side. Patient self-administered. You know, it's it's easy to just say that, but it's like it makes so much difference in terms of cost and pricing. And as as uh, our American cousins know. Uh, you know, if you, in the United States, you can have the, the most magical drug curing cancer, diabetes, heart disease, liver, but if the, the insurance companies don't pay for it, if the payers don't pay for it, you really don't have anything. And, you know, we, we can give you examples of companies that came up with great uh, products, but, you know, at $90,000 a treatment, uh, nobody paid for it, and they they were they had to be withdrawn. So our our uh, cost differentiation here and being able to price it with the pairs in the U.S. is very important in a realistic approach to launching a drug. And I think we have the understanding of how we want to do this uh, that stands uh, uh, different from all the other 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 groups. And regulatory hurdles in our case is uh, quite low. Uh, path of least resistance uh, makes it easier to recruit patients and get this through its, uh, uh, its various uh, development stages. So uh, uh, we have two um, uh, patents uh, issued that eliminate uh, regulatory hurdles and obviates the needs for synthesizing the Schedule One control substance, um, LSD, and the need for using List One starting materials. Uh, as you see in this slide, uh, you know we have we have we have checked with the Health Canada and other regulatory agencies. Uh, you know, two bromo LSD TD zero one four eight A is not regulated. is not uh, It's not a scheduled molecule, and no barriers, legal barriers to surmount. We don't need any laws to be changed. Okay, so for all these other, you've heard, you've, you know, some of you are familiar with cannabis space. Uh, changing laws at the uh, you know municipal, state, federal level is hard. I mean, especially U.S. Congress, uh, with the way it is to get to get uh, things passed. So our approach is we don't need laws to be changed. We don't need to speculate uh, what one party versus one who's going to come to power at what level that would have you know more more leniency towards psychedelics. Uh, we think we, we, we can we can we, we we don't need to wait for any laws to be changed. We also have method of use patent for uh, initially for de depression, treatment resistant depression, migraines, PTSD, and other uh, other mental health disorders. Market opportunity. Uh, to be honest, this this slide um, uh, you know the numbers are changing. Uh, in UK, depending on who you believe and which presentation you want, that they are massive and people are, uh, you know, you can subjectively pull data from any any uh, uh, source you want, but we know it's large and uh, people are, you know, from depending who you believe, one in five uh, U.S. adults are suffering from depression to globally, potentially at 300 million people. Uh, market is is in any way you look at it is quite uh, quite massive. So uh, and COVID hasn't helped. Uh, we're we're all been isolated uh, 
for uh, more than a year, and uh, that hasn't helped uh, in in uh, people's uh, mental health uh, state. So um, I already mentioned what our indications are. Uh, you know, additional indications we are we are considering cluster headache. Uh, this one was done uh, previously, and we, we think this is one of the, the while as a subset of. Uh, uh, different mental health uh, issues. It's it's something that it it would be a low hanging fruit for us. PTSD, severe anxiety. Uh, we do have uh, Tom Lofren in our team uh, of advisors. He was, uh, he's at Mass General, uh, thirty years experience in as a psychiatrist, and ten years uh, with the Veterans Affairs U U.S. military. He treated uh, soldiers. With PTSD, so we've we've spent quite a bit of time talking to uh, experts around the country in the United States, especially uh, on putting a, a great advisory team together. So uh, for this compound, to Bromo LSD uh, filing of IND early next year, followed uh, by phase one and a phase two uh, later uh, in uh, Q4 of 2022. Uh, second compound, the hydroquinocal. Uh, this one is, uh, I mean, I compare this to a cannabis uh, uh, space in a way that, uh, you know, there were lots of companies throwing everything they could at the cannabis so with various things, but there was a one or two like GW Pharma that took cannabis that's been around for uh, centuries uh, and uh, did it properly through a, a FDA, IND, uh, you know, filing and really got the value out of it. So this is a Honokil uh, is from Magnolia Bark. Uh, it's been shown, it's been used for decades as Chinese medicines. It's, uh, uh, it has an uh, active anti-anxiety ingredient and uh, animal studies or several animal studies, couple of human trials, and uh, it's currently sold as nutraceutical. So we believe uh, we have a patent uh, uh, pending process uh, we have our formulation, we have improved the bioavailability. It's a very insoluble compound. And um, in animal studies, it's shown to have no side effects like benzodiazepine has. I have heard firsthand from investors or groups that see our press releases that this is a real, you know, they have people close to them that are suffering from dependency on benzodiazepine because, you know, they, they need the treatment. So, um, lots of anecdotal reports on the efficacy of this thing. So it's really, we have put uh, a very uh, detailed clinical plan. Uh, we're in the synthesis uh, stage right now to take this to its uh, you know, next stages. Uh, our, uh, this, uh, our TD010 is uh, formulated uh, with our patented formulation to overcome poor bioavailability. And it's also covered by a method of use patent. So uh, our, our method of use is really uh, for anxiety, benzodiazepine dependency, insomnia, among others. Market opportunity, uh, benzodiazepines are used right now. They're, you know, the market is around three and a half billion going to four uh, rise in uh, anxiety, seizures and other uh, disorders. Uh, is taking you know the the use of benzodiazepines to a, to a, a, a higher level, and although it's legal, benzodiazepines are legal, but they're highly addictive. So majority of the users risk dependency, and that's where really we we come in with our TD zero one zero. We believe it could be a a very large market. A uh, development plan set very similar to TD0148A uh, 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 in a phase one starting next uh, early next year and a phase two uh, uh, following that. I'm gonna switch to gears to a little bit about our, our interferon uh, 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 alpha-2B inhalation formulation for uh, treatment of COVID. This one, we really worked on it for, uh, this is before uh, uh, when we were uh, private at the time, we developed this uh, very unique way of manufacturing interferon. 
Uh, we couldn't get it from Merck. Merck was exiting, it, so we really had to do it ourselves uh, with the help of Fujifilm uh, in UK, an expert, various experts, biologics, fermentations, and so on, uh, headed by our uh, CMC group, uh, uh, our head of CMC group, Scott Raj in Colorado. We, we put in, uh, uh, again, after two and a half years of work, uh, the process development of purity and uh, a very novel, this is with the help of National Research Council of Canada, uh, it came up with a cloning procedure to make the most pure isoform free interferon, even Merck didn't have it at these levels for the treatment of um, COVID and other viral infections and uh, you know the, the administration being through the lungs. And I, I'm, I know most in, uh, people will say, well, a vaccination is coming, why are, you know, is there a need? We believe there's a need for this. The few groups that are working on treatment side of things like us from various angles to hit this virus, we believe there's a cocktail going to be needed uh, to treat the virus uh, while vaccination is going to cover most people. Uh, you know, there's pockets of people that are, it just doesn't work on, or they don't want to get, uh, uh, they don't want to get uh, the vaccine. And there's now reports coming that people have been vaccinated even after double dose. So now they're getting, I think there were reports from Israel that uh, there's spread of the virus and they're getting infected. So, uh, and our numbers are not based on, you know, treating 10 million, 20 million people uh, as with other treat groups, our, our uh, numbers are based on a uh, few hundred thousand a year uh, globally, which is a more realistic, uh, 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 you know, model to, to build your, uh, your NPV valuations and so on. So uh, why AP003? We know how COVID works. I mean, the planet has been, uh, um, uh, you know, everyone knows about uh, COVID. Uh, in uh, COVID, uh, when COVID hits, uh, it blocks interferon production in infected cells. This is, uh, this is um, documented and studies came out uh, since early last year showing that uh, people who suffered worse uh, with COVID were the ones that had lower levels of interferon. So treatment with interferon may overcome that block, restoring cells, uh, normal antiviral activity, which is the best, uh, best defense you have. Um, I, you know, I, our advisor, one of our advisors, Dr. Eleanor Fish, was involved in, the, in uh, using uh, inhalation of interferon in Wuhan with her colleagues early, early on last uh, year, uh, where, where this whole thing started and they saw great results. Uh, again, it was Chinese uh, interferon, so we don't know the purity of that. The nebulizers weren't uh, that accurate. So that's what we've done in the last uh, uh, year or so, put all that together to, to start uh, and, and with a unique formulation that we have. So at the first sign of COVID, we believe that administration of this, uh, uh, um, it greatly helps reduce uh, hospitalization and prevent uh, this from, from progressing. Uh, so it is directly applied to the lungs. You know, virus doesn't enter your liver or your, or your uh, kidneys or your heart, it enters through your lungs. So this, this will uh, really, we, we think it was uh, inhalation of it will restore uh, the initial immune response to COVID-19. And um, we, we really think that uh, at the higher dose for the treatment of COVID-19, but we also have uh, in the pipeline a lower dose to prevent viral infection in the first place. So uh, we're excited about this. Again, this drug interferon has been around for decades, 30, 40 years, uh, but in, in terms of its antiviral efficacy through the lungs and inhalation of this, our unique formulation and the patents we put around it, uh, we think we have a great advantage and, and, uh, uh, and something that will be needed for treatment as, as a cocktail of treatments, just like we have for HIV. We have a cocktail of treatments that, that work very effectively now. So uh, hopefully in a, you know, a year or two, no one should die of COVID, combination of vaccination and 
uh, this cocktail of treatments uh, should should do the trick. So, um, you know, we have a unique market position. Uh, uh, the studies, as as I mentioned, have shown this to be effective against uh, COVID-19, uh, early, early stage COVID-19. And we will position AP033, uh, you know, for other respiratory viruses as well, like MERS and SARS. Uh, is also used to be uh, uh, the, the lower dose uh, could be used as a prophylaxis uh, and prevention. So that's also a huge uh, market opportunity. We have reached to various agencies uh, that if you can imagine at the onset of this last year, if uh, US military, hospitals, schools, uh, public uh, people, uh, frontline workers that, that, need, uh, that had to be with the public, if they had this, uh, lower dose form, and they would they would uh, have a higher, you know, more alert immune system to fight this. We would have prevented a lot of needless uh, suffering by the frontline healthcare workers and nurses that died uh, in the in the early days. So we have a very strong patent on the composition of interferon alpha two B. Again, we we worked on this uh, um, long before COVID. And it's manufactured, you know, right now, uh, most, most of the, you know, like interferon for 2 b is manufactured uh, from recombinant clones that, that generate a different isoform of interferon, if you will, impurities. So we have the only, only method that is, uh, produces isoform free interferon and uh, patent protection uh, uh, cover the use of uh, interferon uh, to treat COVID-19. We have a very unique formulation that we developed uh, for stability and other purposes. And also we have filed a, a method of use um, for potential treatment uh, of, of various uh, virus infections. Um, the, the, the development, uh, we, 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 would, we are aiming to file a IND uh, later this year with a phase two trial starting in the US uh, sometime early next year. We have a very strong team. I believe uh, this, this is, uh, 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 you know, my background. I, I went through it uh, a little bit with our COO, Hushman from, uh, you know, previous with Roche and Pharmacia, all large pharma experience uh, with, with uh, deep knowledge of what it takes to take a drug from uh, you know, various stages and properly, uh, you know, anybody can really call the uh, FDA and say, let's say, let's, uh, we want to present our case or our file. FDA will grant you that, but if it's, it's not the, the right package and if you don't have the right, uh, you, you won't get any, any, anywhere. So this team is really, uh, you see Scott Raj, uh, our CMC, head of our CMC, Moira, our CFO, uh, Abdi from, uh, uh, preclinical research, and you know Jeff Fellows and the rest of the regulatory team. We really have the best group that uh, a, a great group that can put uh, the best IND file. Uh, so with the least risk of uh, you know looking silly in front of the FDA or getting setback uh, pushbacks uh, for for uh, uh, approval. So this is our this is our company, and I'm happy to. Uh, we are just just on recent events. Uh, we closed uh, uh, in in two rounds uh, back to back because there was there was demand uh, close to nine million in Canadian in 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 fun financing. So we're cashed up for the uh, work that we want to do through the first quarter of next year. Uh, we have about eighty four million shares outstanding, so that puts us around. 20 million market cap, and um, you know, compared to uh, compared to peers and other companies, uh, both in both of those psychedelic and antiviral, this is a significant uh, uh, upside potential for us. So we're excited. We're excited about the rest of the year. Um, I'm sleeping easier now. Once you have the funding, and uh, that you can uh, execute, it makes life a lot easier. And um, you know we're we're really excited to get the next uh, 
a quarter or two under our belt, generate data and, uh, and make a difference. So uh, thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions and I'll... Uh... Ahmad, could you say a little bit about present market cap versus that of some of the comparators or peer companies? Yeah, so I think when I look at uh, on the antiviral side, uh, Synergen uh, developing a beta version of interferon, which I know, Mark, you're, you've been uh, skeptical uh, on, on the efficacy of that. So um, they are developing it for COVID. Uh, it's, it's um, uh, I think they have about 400 million market cap. It's an inhaled uh, interferon alpha two, uh, sorry, beta. Um, Humanogen uh, and Cytodyne, uh, Humanogen is on NASDAQ, Cytodyne is on, uh, on OTC. I mean, if you look at the reports, especially Humanogen, based on treating 80,000 patients, they, they have a target price of uh, close to 3 billion market cap. They're at 1 billion right now. And this is just, you know, this is just on the antiviral side. On the psychedelic side, uh, you know, from uh, MindMed Compass uh, field trip, uh, the range is between 300 million to one and a half billion. And those folks are about, you know, taking LSD or psilocybin or ibogaine, treating people in, uh, in uh, clinics. Yeah, I, actually, let me, let me, while we're on this, uh, you, you, you can still see my slide, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So if you look at uh, Patrick Krupa and Justin, these two guys were uh, the founders of Transcend Biodynamics. They really had, especially Patrick, quite a bit of experience in the psychedelic space. Patrick and two partners run a, a, a clinic, uh, addiction clinic in Cancun, and they treat patients with psychedelics. And they, they you know, firsthand, uh, said, you know, it's easier said than done. Uh, and the cost of this is not for regular, this is high net worth people, people who can afford 20 to $40,000 a, a treatment to go to this clinic to be treated, monitored, uh, and supervised. So he's one of the biggest proponent that if you really want to open this up, you need a non hallucinogenic approach. So it doesn't, and um, again, I've been doing this now for seven months on various formats and presentations. I have one investor who, uh, who called me, said, uh, you know, I had depression and I was treated with the MDMA. Uh, and the first time uh, I went there, uh, it was good. Uh, I was seeing colors. I saw my father, I childhood, a great experience. I woke up the second time, same dose, same place, same bed. I was in, it was a nightmare. I could not wait to get out of there. I was seeing monsters and this and that experience. I suffered after that. So, you know, I mean, how do you control hallucinations? You know, as a side effect, even, even from one hallucination to the next. So we believe in a more, uh, you know, if you want to price something, I've dealt with you as payers. You want to price something at 15 to $20,000 versus, you know, $1,500. What, what, what do you... We, we, you know, in, in terms of getting getting payers to sign up, it's, it's a completely different uh, uh, numbers that you're looking at, and and so we believe we can we can uh, make a difference with this, uh, with with these assets that I mentioned to you, and in a way from where, where I come from, which is the pharma side, they are somewhat de risk because they have been in man before. They have been, you know, it's not some new molecule no one has ever tested in an animal or in a human being. So that part of it is somewhat de risk. Uh, toxicity is well known, uh, dose ranges are known, and it just, you know, we have managed to put around uh, uh, enough IP and protection around it to protect us and, and novel formulations to make you know, treat these large markets uh, of unmet needs right now. Yeah, and uh, building on Mark's uh, question, you know, you mentioned MyMed. Um, there's also a, a tie that just came public with a $2.8 billion market yeah. cap, Compass Pathways with $1.3 billion. And um, 
they're all dealing with hallucinogenics and right. the need to build out, uh, you know, clinics and things like that. Uh, so, you know, and right. they're a little bit further along. They're in they're in the phase one and two trials. But I'm just saying from a market, you know, cap standpoint, where they are, you know, at, in the billions versus where you are at 20, I think there's a, a ton of value here. Um, for people to take a look at, you know, especially considering 2021 and 2022 are going to be pretty pivotal years. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, the, absolutely. Uh, last week I was at the uh, H.C. Wainwright Psychedelic Conference. I mean, presentation after presentation and the feedback that came back to me from uh, the, their healthcare uh, side, uh, investment banking group, was that it really is a few companies that stand out, and he, you know, he he he's obviously a, a supporter of us. But in terms of a, 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 an approach that is more practical and workable, uh, it really is only three companies. Atai that you mentioned does have a division that's working on uh, working on uh, uh, an analog of uh, uh, psilocybin, I believe. But um, again, there's not that many that, are, that have taken this approach and we don't want to go raise a hundred million dollars just to open 50 clinics. You know, that's not our, our plan. We think this is a different for therapeutic and treatments uh, is a much better practical approach. Yeah. So from the standpoint of, um, you know, the cash, you mentioned that, um, that you've raised nine million Canadian. Um, can you can you talk about kind of the priority for that money, where it's going to take you? I know it'll take you into next year, but wh where is that money going to be put to work? Um, yeah. So the, the the majority of it, again, we had to really make an assessment uh, of the best bang for this buck, most efficient use of capital. Where can we get the most data? and make the most advanced. And uh, it's really the management and the advisors and the experts that we have, the majority of that is gonna be spent on our lead psychedelic compound. Uh, I think this is the TD01. I have to perhaps that on the antiviral side, we have spent $15 million before mm -hmm. when we were private on advancing the interferon and we'll be spending uh, a little more in con concluding the, the trial in Chile, which, which we started previous to that. And that's not something that, but for the, the most efficient music, the majority would be spent on the, on the psychedelic compounds. Uh, and, and once we have some additional clinical data on the interferon, I think from the management and board's perspective, uh, we'll look at this very early, well, late this year or early next year is to, for next steps, do we need a partner or do we, you know, uh, uh, do it ourselves? So it's, 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 it's some, one of the things that we're looking where we are uh, exploring options that, that might, that would be the best uh, course of action and the most value generator for, for us. So oh, do you, yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I was just uh, that, yeah, that's uh, that's what we were doing. Yeah, I was just going to say for the lead psychedelic, do you think that money can get you through phase one? Uh, it will get us to phase one again okay. for all of this right now that I showed you for the IND package. We need uh, seven different sets of preclinical studies. <laughs> And as you saw in our press release this morning, uh, glad one of them is gonna be paid for the Carleton University anti-depression studies. Uh, we were able to get a grant from uh, Metcast here. We, we made a joint application with uh, Carleton and um, it's, it's funded by uh, uh, agencies here that are funded by the federal and provincial governments but they basically fund innovative research that can make an impact. So our, uh, our group and, and Carlton applied for this grant uh, uh, and we're happy to, it's gonna be funded by, by, by you know, this is a grant. So there's, it's, a, it's a found money that, that I like uh, to, to fund this research. 
So um, yeah, go, I think going forward, uh, where we're looking at generating, uh, as I said, you know, my experience is you've got to sweat the details here. Uh, if you go before the FDA with a Mickey Mouse package, try to shortcut and sound cute and all of that, you are, you're only hurting yourself. You're only going to be delaying things and so on. So if, you know, we're doing a most comprehensive set of preclinical studies. Again, none of this is, is uh, something that, you know, totally unknown. There's a lot of data on Tubromo LSC already. There's a lot of data on, on uh, TD010 uh, previously. So, but we are tweaking, optimizing all of this into one package, if you will, that is going to be bulletproof when we submit it to the FDA. So we don't get comments back and do this and do that, that, that would just delay things. So, Ahmad, for those companies, unlike Better Life, that are onboarding, you know, actual hallucinogens, I, <laughs> I recall a patient from years ago who had um, done a small amount of LSD at a party and her life was saved uh, by a well-meaning other person at the party who stopped her from climbing over the guardrail on a porch on a 10th story window because in her hallucination, her soul had drifted out of her body and was in a tree out there. And she was going to walk on air to go get her soul yeah. back. It's crazy yeah, stuff. We, like we've that. heard stories like that, uh, Mark. That's why you have to be in a clinic. You need a therapist right. and, and, and a you know, healthcare worker or nurse or st someone to monitor you so you don't think you can fly or... Uh, walk off things or or go through walls. So uh, I would contend it's still I contend it's still dangerous even in those settings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and the the it's not consistent as I mentioned. I've I've heard firsthand uh, hallucinations are not consistent. So while we believe maybe in severe cases uh, you do need to go to a clinic. Maybe that's you know if you're diagnosed uh, as severe, but the majority uh, of people. Uh, um, you know, they, they, I think treatment is much better if you can do it at home. Um, just like, I mean, I, I use antibiotics as a thing. If you have severe infection and it's becoming systemic, you go to a hospital, you get an IV. You have to. But by far, majority of people, when they have an infection, they go to a pharmacy, they get an antibiotic based on a regimen that is instructed, you apply that at home and you get rid of that infection. So this is kind of the thing. So while these clinics will be needed in certain cases, uh, you know, we, we believe that majority of people uh, for, uh, should be treated uh, at home. And Ahmad, you know, for those who sort of say, well, you know, who needs, you know, new drugs like these, there's always esketamine. The esketamine antidepressant, you know, prosynaptogenic effect lasts for two days only per dose. It's right. very short lived. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I want to switch um, gears here and talk about the COVID antiviral. You know, you said earlier, you know, the need for COVID antiviral um, is still very important. People with vaccines are still getting um, COVID. Um, there are people out there who refuse to get vaccines. Um, and so the need is, is going to be there. This was used in Wuhan. Can you talk about that study and the effectiveness of it? Because I think that's really important. Yeah, that study was done in 77 patients. Um, this is last January, as you can imagine, at the outset of this was coming out. Uh, COVID was coming out. And Eleanor uh, and her colleagues, Dr. Zhu in, in uh, China, this is a practitioner that was, her team were actually administering this. Out of 77 patients, every single one recovered. They didn't need hospitalization. They didn't have uh, the, the, the severe cases or you know, ventilation and all that. The, the, and you know, it really uh, became uh, 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 obvious in a way for people like Mark who know interferon, who know who have, who have prescribed it, that 
uh, this 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 makes sense. This is an antiviral agent, but it works through the enhancement of the immune system. That's that's how it works. And what we say is that with drugs, vaccines, uh, and other treatments, pathogens, viruses, bacteria, they can develop resistance, right? Variants, right? When there's a variant, but they cannot they cannot develop a resistance to interferon. Interferon Correct. is such an intricate uh, set of things that in the, the body uh, produces proteins that inhibit virus replication. It's our, it's our first line of defense in, in many, many ways. Millions so, of years of perfection have made it just this definitive agent that RNA viruses as a category run from. They're terrified of it. Right. Seriously. So we think this is going to be one of those treatments that will be needed in, and, and you see the long-term effects of COVID, the people who get this is really at the heart of it is because you have weakened immune system that allows other things to linger on and damage different tissues and so on. I mean, we don't have all the answers, obviously, this is still you know, a, a year and a half uh, story versus other things that we know decades of. But for, for us uh, having a treatment uh, for, you know, as part of the cocktail, like other things, remdesivir, you know, directly attacking the virus or reducing inflammation. And in our case, with the immune system, we should have a really good chance, just like we do with HIV right now, that no one should die of COVID. I mean, you know, like HIV uh, is, is a good example. Freddie Mercury would be alive today if he was diagnosed. He wouldn't have, uh, I'm a big fan that's of Queen. True. That's why I bring that up, but. So am I. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, so Dr. Fish, Dr. Fish's study, you know, was obviously the efficacy is there. Mark, can you talk about, is there anything to worry about in, um, for interferon in, in terms of um, safety issues or, you know, what would be the main concern? The, the concerns of the interferon days for hep C were depression, weight loss, and, and almost daily high fevers. But what Better Life is doing is intrapulmonary or inhaled administration, which is probably going to bypass all that. There's very little evidentiary basis to think that the interferon will be meaningfully systemically absorbed. The, the place where it's needed is there in the lungs and they're delivering it right to that. I think it's ingenious. And uh, Ahmad, I don't really expect a lot of, you know, blowback, you know, downside therapeutic side effects the way we faced daily with almost every hep C yeah. patient in that era. You know. Yeah, I think um, uh, we, have, we, we have data that shows that there's no systemic uh, uh, presence of interferon that, that basically caused all those side effects. So if you're just applying it directly to the lung tissue and it's absorbed at the surface and it, it works on, on, you know, um, it works locally versus systemically is a completely different uh, uh, mode of action and um, with minimal, minimal side effects. Now, it's a really exciting, um, really exciting drug. And I think that, you know, COVID is here to stay for a long time, unfortunately, and we'll be battling this for a long time. Um, potential NASDAQ listing possible, Ahmad? Are you guys looking at that or is that something yeah, that's... Yeah, we were, we were looking at that. I think part of the uh, issue right now is uh, now that we have the the funding, I think uh, we 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 would we don't want to rush toward Nasdaq. We'll do a disservice to our shareholders if we. Are, I mean, there are certain requirements of Nasdaq uh, that that you know most of it. I've taken companies to Nasdaq. You just want to do it at the right time to minimize uh, any kind of uh, you know further dilution or rollbacks and things like that. So. Uh, we're not into that. We think the value of these shares should uh, should get there on its own uh, with the funding that we have and the quality of the programs and uh, the valuation of the assets should carry us to NASDAQ. And when we're ready for that, you know, uh, 
we, we have everything in place to do it. It's just yeah. right now, I think we're, we're looking at perhaps end of the year, starting to look seriously into that. Yeah. And I, we're, we're kind of running out of time, but I want to mention, okay. um, you know, it seems to me like, you know, a lot of this, has, you know, the company has been de-risked due to the no needs for laws to be passed and things like that. Um, so my question is, in, 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 this, in the sense that um, you're, you're not dealing with a hallucinogenic, do you think that speeds up the process for potential FDA approval versus some of these companies who are dealing with, you know? I think so. I think if nothing else is in terms of patient recruitment, the centers that you can you can uh, engage with versus centers that have have to have specialized people for hallucination and uh, storing the drugs in a secure manner and things like that versus something that's not controlled and it just opens up at least at, you know at, in terms of the recruitment side a lot faster which sometimes is a limiting factor in finishing a clinical trial. So in that sense, I think the data that you need to generate is the data and that's, you know, uh, the package is the same, but in terms of uh, how much faster you can do this uh, when you don't have all those restrictions, it, it, it will be, you know, much, much quicker. Yeah, and I certainly think that, um, you know, it, it'll definitely be easier for you to find, um, you know, participants. So that's... Mm just even another positive. So I think we're going to leave it there. Um, okay. I want to thank you, Ahmad and Mark. We really appreciate you coming on today to get us up to speed on Better Life's pipeline of drugs and anticipated milestones. Uh, thank you. Again, 2021 and 2022 are going to be pivotal years. And I want everyone who's on the call to understand that when you look at other companies like MindMed and Atai and, and Compass, um, you know, they're in the billions in market cap and uh, you know, we think that Better Life has, um, you know, really found a, a, a better way to, to do this. And it's just in the very early stages, but we think um, that uh, this company has a lot of potential and let's really take a look at it. Uh, I think it's a Spitfire company just flying for now, still under radar, maybe not for a lot longer. But. Exactly. Um, but in the meantime, you can get additional information on Better Life Pharma at the company's comprehensive website at abetterlifepharma.com, including details on the company's current pipeline of drugs, as well as additional information and press releases. Um, and I want to thank all of our attendees for taking the time today to learn more about the company and I look forward to your feedback and attendance at a future podcast presentation produced by Tory Hills Capital. Uh, thanks again, Ahmad and Mark. Until then, until the next time, everybody be safe, be well, and um, we will talk soon. Thank you. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye.